good evening. I, I welcome you to the March meeting of, of Full Council at Alexandra Palace. Please know that this meeting has been streamed live to the public and available on, on the Council website. This meeting will also be recorded by the Council for future broadcasts via the Council's internet site. Please note this meeting may be filled by anyone attending the meeting using any communication method. Although we ask members of the public recording, filming or reporting on the meeting not to include the public sitting areas, members of the public attending the meeting should be aware that we cannot guarantee that you will not be filmed or recorded by others attending this meeting. By entering the meeting room and using the public seating area, you're consenting to be filmed and to and to the possibility, sorry, sorry, and to the possible use of those images as sound recordings. Before we start this item, please, um, can, can I share check that everything is OK? This meeting is available to the public. OK, yeah. excellent. Thank you very much. Before I start this meeting, I'd like to put it on record. I'd like to thank my uh, the deputy mayor, Lester, for stepping in the last three weeks. As you many of you know that um, I, I wasn't able to uh, do any events or chair the last meeting because I had a, a car accident. So I, I'm not I'm still not 100 percent. And if you don't see me turning my head to see you, please Forgive me, don't think I'm ignoring you. It's just restrictions I have on my neck. I thought I'll let you know in advance. Um, item two, apologies for absence. Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, I have apologies from councillors Dunstall, Davis, Da Costa, Ali, Maboub, Jogi, uh, Isla Gosling and Councillor Wallace and apologies for lateness from Councillor Stennett. Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. Um, item three, late items of urgent business. Chief Executive. Uh, Madam Mayor, I am asking you to agree the admission of the following late items of business that could not be available earlier and need to be dealt with at this meeting. Item 7.1, the draft council calendar of meetings 2023 to 24. This was to allow further consultation and comment on the proposed meeting dates. Item 10A, standards committee report was late to allow finalisation and consultation on the report. There is a need to agree the changes to the committee structure and the constitution before the start of the next municipal year. Also, there is a need to agree members allowance scheme for 2023-24 prior to the 31st of March and to agree the extension of the appointment of independent members to the standards committee at an ordinary meeting of the council prior to the 30th of June 2023. And item um, 13 questions with written answers. The reasons for lateness here is that the notice of questions is not requested until eight days prior to the meeting, following which the matters raised have to be researched and replies prepared to, uh, prepared to be given at the meeting. And item 14, motions. The amendments to motions are not requested until 10 a.m. on the day of the council meeting, and we have received an amendment to motion E, which has been published and distributed today as a supplementary pack. Thank you, Chief Executive. I accept these as late items of business for the reasons outlined. Item four. Please can members consider the formation on agenda item four on the front of the agenda. Would anyone like to declare an interest? No, thank you. Move on. Item five, minutes of the council. 
meetings held on the 15th of February 2023 and 7th of March 2023. I call on the Chief Executive. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I would ask the Council to approve as a correct record the minutes of the meeting held on the 13th of February 2023 and the 2nd of March 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Executive. Are they agree? Thank you. Now, now we we'll move on to item six. I have emailed my communications to members prior to this meeting. We will begin with one minute silence to pay our respect to the late Conservative Councillor William MacDonald, who was a council member for Highgate Ward between 1998 to 2002. And then we will continue this item with some Haringey heroes, certificate awards for the Haringey athletic teams. Please, can we stand for a minute silence to pay our respect to the family of former councillor William McDonald's who currently passed. We are, we are joined here today by some true heroes from our community. Those hard work and team spirit has put Haringey on the map. Last year, for the first time in our history, the Haringey athletic team won both the London Youth Games and the Jubilee Trophy. This fantastic club recently shows off the best of Haringey and what our young people can achieve. And what we are incredibly proud of what we have done. The Council would like to congratulate you all on your successes and would like to thank you and your coaches and staff who have helped the young people to achieve this. We all look forward to watching you all achieve and wish you all the best of luck. This is not to say that we forget, we forget the parents. We like to thank the parents of the young people as well for their commitment. In addition, I'm also pleased to announce that the Haringey Athletic Girls Cricket team have won the London Youth Games Girls Cricket Competition, defeating Redbridge, Lambert, Ealing, and Bromley. Well done to all of you, I say. I will ask my deputy to call out the names of the team members. Please come up and receive your certificate. And also, would the leader of the council like to join us? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, apologies if the, I pronounce anything wrong. So, Joshua Dos Santos, Amy Kirk, Darnell Bowens, Jada Thompson, Kevin Silva, Melissa Azari, Millie Bridgman, Nathaniel McPherson, Premis Saku, Oliver Linzel, Rocco Fiori, Sam Turner, Serian Carbongo, Sienna Boteng, Trizzy Ono Wilson, Layla Madari Agav, 
Ellie Baker and the following team members who are unable to make it today. Ollie Linzel, Maya Kowalski, Millie Roxburg, Oscar Yu and Vita Brandon. Uh, I like to thank the young people very much indeed. I it's, it's great to see you here and it's lovely. And again, I'd like to congratulate you and say well done. You're welcome to stay if you want for the rest of the meeting. But if you do decide to leave, that's fine again. <laughs> so thank you very much. Well done. Um, now we have item seven. I call on the chief executive. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Item seven point one is asking council to note the changes to the political composition set out at paragraph four point two, and requesting that the resultant changes to council body membership, as detailed in paragraphs four point seven to four point four ten, be agreed. And then item seven point two is an outline of the schedule of meetings for the municipal year twenty twenty three to 24 for approval. This was in the supplementary pack and contained at, at pages one to 12. Uh, thank you. I'll call on the chief whip. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the recommendations in both reports are agreed. Are the recommendations agreed? Thank you. I told a call on the monitoring officer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A full council meeting on 2nd of March 2023 approved the budget and level of council tax for 23-24. Unfortunately, the published report contained one small rounding error of one penny for one council tax burn found. This has been amended on the bill sent out to residents using the decision making process set out at paragraph 3.5 of the report. However, this decision needs to be ratified for, by full council at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I call on the cabinet member for finance and local investment. Councillor Williams. I move the recommendations. Is this agreed? Thank you very much. Item nine. 
I call on the cabinet member for climate action, environment and transport and deputy leader of the council, Councillor Hagada. You've got five minutes. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and good to see you back in the chair. Um, right, so, so this is to introduce the 12th annual carbon report, which is uh, now in our constitution as something that we publish every year. Um, which reports on the carbon reductions in the council and the borough um, annually. Um, and I'm going to start with the bad news, which is that 2022 saw climate change come, if it wasn't already here and wasn't visible, really come to London and to Haringey with temperatures reaching 40 degrees, drought and floods. Um, we began to see what others have been seeing in the rest of the world for some time. But even in 2022, globally, there was extreme weather as um, as a real and present danger. USA, um, uh, Brazil, Nigeria, Pakistan, we saw um, floods, we saw landslides. We saw extreme temperatures up into the 50 degree, up over 50 degrees in Australia, 47 degrees in the USA, and Europe was um, was scorching. Hundreds of thousands of people were displaced last year, um, as a portent of the kind of things we are expecting to see if we don't act on uh, the the threat. The IPCC released its sixth annual assessment report last on, in 2022 and showed that temperature, temperatures had risen by 1.1 degrees since pre-industrial times due to humans pumping out tra heat trapping gases into the atmosphere, shifting the flow of energy around the planet and creating this uh, the, the changes in these weather patterns. Climate predictions have been accurate. 50 years ago, 1970 was the Charning Report, which was one of the first reports into climate change and um, and the effects of the increase of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. 50 years ago, they predicted that um, the temperature rises, which have uh, which have aligned with what they are now. So since that report there's been a 21 percent increase in uh, annual concentrations of co2 and the global average temperatures have increased by 0.66 which is basically within a 0.01 or 0.01 centigrade of those predictions back then so that's the bad news the good news is that we haven't been sitting on our laurels and as a borough from Council to residents and campaigners, we've been working together and the annual report, carbon report talks about the kind of work that's been done and the results that have been achieved. So we have reached our 4020 target that was set in 2012, which shows that this council has been taking this borough and this council has been taking climate change seriously for 10, over a decade now. And um, we re the 4020 target was to get a 40% reduction in our CO2 emissions by um, 2020. We've actually exceeded that by 43%. And I'm pleased to say that 12% of that reduction was between 2015 and 2019. But actually in the la in the from 2019 to 20 was where we had a significant amount of 6.2%. Now these are based on um, uh, base Bayes, the department, um, um, government department's uh, um, analysis that is always got a two year lag so we don't have last year's but we expect to see that those increases especially with the kind of things that we've been doing um, um, increasing so in terms of our emissions in this borough the three main emitters are domestic industrial and transport and to address those we have been doing huge amounts both in the community and in the council with solar PV, street lighting, turning to LED, the council fleet being decarbonised, waste reduction and recycling, aiming for that 50%, that destination 50%, carbon literacy training now for all staff, new builds, um, our new builds are now I think 
on average 87% reductions in carbon emissions, retrofitting um, that ho our homes and our schools, supporting businesses, school streets, low traffic neighbourhoods, EV. I could go on and on with the list. I won't because I can see that. But all I will say is that, you know, what the last point, that, Madam Mayor, if I may, is just to say that our net zero target in 20, 2041, we've still got a huge amount to do. We're actually behind on that. So we've got to up the ante and look at how further we can re um, reduce the emissions on our roads, in our houses, and um, in our in our industries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope it's working. Um, is the, is this report a great? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, item 10 is the Sanders Committee Report on Constitutional and Committee Changes 2023-2024, Approval of the Members Allowances Scheme 23-24, and Extension of Appointments of Independent Person on Standards Committee. I call on the Chair of Standards, Councillor Obugu, to move this report. Thank you, Madam Mayor, um, fellow councillors, and ladies and gentlemen in the audience. So as the mayor has said, it's just to approve the members allowance scheme, extending the uh, independent person, and then also some constitutional changes, which are mainly creation of the corporate committee and staffing and mediation committees, and then actually establishing an audit committee, general purposes committee, and panels that will sit under the general purposes committee, which are the appointments panel and the disciplinary and grievance and disciplinary panels. So, I move the recommendations as well in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other recommendations set out in the supplementary park on pages 17 to 19 agreed. Okay, thank you. Now we move to item 11. This is a having a debate to, re to remind members of the process. I will introduce the debate and I will then invite the guest speakers to speak for up to 10 minutes. We will then start to debate. The cabinet member will respond to the debate and I will make some closing remarks. As a mayor, as a councillor, I should say, not a mayor, <laughs> as a councillor over 30 years, I have been, I have seen devastating impact on mental health services problem, sorry, mental health problems can have on our community. The COVID pandemic and the cost of living crisis have impacted many people far and wide at the world in time. When resources and services in our national health service are much reduced, those impacts have left people without the vital support they need. In Haringe alone, nearly 54,000 people have been affected by mental health problems. That's why I chose Mind in Haringe as my mayoral charity to provide them the platform for the, for the people of our community and offer support to as many people who need it. Since their establishment in 1974, they have provided care and assistance by listening, respecting, and, re and reassuring countless residents who have been impacted by mental health problems. Over those years, they have seen various crucial services, including Black Thrive, Generation Girls, and the Haringey Wellbeing Network. They have been champions of challenging the stigma of mental health issues and spreading awareness of the difficulties people face. But above all, they provide the compassion and caring dedication to people facing problems, which lead to real improvements and impacts felt by individuals across our community. Mental health problems will always be a terrible issue that can cause pain and worry for us and our families at any time, and having the support 
and guidance for mind in Haringey is a lifeline. We are extremely lucky to have them. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all those who have been part of mind in Haringey and dedicate their time to this vital service, especially Lynette Charles and Deborah King for all they do. And I invite both Lynette and Deborah to make their representations. And I will also invite Anne Donner, a member of the community, to also speak from a community perspective on understanding and tackling mental health and well-being in Haringey communities. There is a total time period for 10 minutes for this, for the debate. Uh, Lynette and uh, Deborah, when you're ready, please. Good evening, everybody. I don't even know if I need a microphone. Can I just say that a um, uh, huge thank you to the mayor and actually quite a lot of the councillors in this room um, and the council um, officers, because I would say that we've had a huge amount of support from each of you, not just for the work that we do at Mind in Haringey, but also you getting involved in our mental health first aid training, which means that you might be able to help those around you. And actually, Gina, you've done such a great introduction um, for us, um, and that is really appreciated. And I'm really glad that we are joined um, by somebody that can actually give us the their lived experience of mental health. Thank you very much for doing it as well. Um, yes, Minding Harangay has been in the borough for um, over 30 years. Um, and you can see in the presentation, I was just trying to give a really quick glance um, at what our borough looks like and then the mental health issues that we have. Um, so as you can see, and probably no surprise to those in this room, we have a population of 264,000 people with a fourth most deprived borough in London with significant health inequalities. And I think that's really important because there are some in our community that we have left behind and we are trying to address that together. 64% uh, of our community are non-white, um, so it is not straightforward always to address some of those mental health inequalities. Um, but let's talk about mental health, because in this borough, unlike Camden, Islet and Barnet and Enfield, uh, we have real uh, mental health issues and a mental health need that is growing. Um, so our colleagues in public health tell us that, that severe mental illness um, in Harringay is 1.4% of the population. So that is about 4,400 people at any given time in this borough have severe mental illness. Uh, and when we look at the common mental health issues like depression and anxiety, we are talking about 24 to 45,000 people in this borough who are experiencing those mental health issues. But actually what we hear from the everyday person in the street is how much of our population of Haringey are experiencing social isolation and loneliness. We all know, and definitely my learned colleagues around this room, that the cost of living crisis is having a major impact on the mental health of our population in Haringey. And that really speaks to the fact that we are, were already a deprived borough. We have a borough um, with a huge population of those who come from diverse communities. Um, and we know from evidence that people living in poverty um, or experiencing financial stress are more likely to develop mental health problems. Due to the cost of living crisis, poverty and financial stress will likely rise over the next few years, no matter what we collectively try to do together, um, because I don't think that we are going to get out of this in the next year. So we really appreciate some of the issues that the council has, um, that we're not going to be able to just create new services in our borough. Um, and actually, a lot of the reports tell us that people are going without the basic living essentials such as food and a warm home. 
Um, and definitely from the conversations that myself and Deborah have had with others in this room, I know together we are trying to address that. We expect that the effects of the cost of living crisis on public mental health will be on a scale similar to COVID-19. And I think if we think about it like that, in the way that we all came together and worked through COVID-19 and the pandemic, we've got a really good way of working together. Um, and we at Mind in Haringey really rely on that. You've already heard from Gina about some of our services, uh, but I just wanted to focus a little bit on two of our services that um, seek to address the health inequalities that some in our borough are experiencing. Um, so I want to talk about the Mental Wellbeing Programme, and that is a programme that we run at Mind in Haringey, and we work with five grassroots organisations, um, and they um, serve populations such as the Turkish community, the Afro-Caribbean community, refugees and migrants, the homeless community, and uh, uh, sorry, the uh, Polish and Eastern European community. And we've done so well working with those grassroots organisations who really know their own communities uh, that that project is being um, funded for another year. So we're really excited because that means that we can carry on the wonderful work that we have been doing with those grassroots organisations. And I appreciate that my time might be running out. So the other project that I'm just going to quickly talk about is our work under Black Friday Haringey. Um, and I'm sure we all know, not just because of the pandemic, but just in general, when we look at the diversity of our population in Haringey, that the black community in Haringey absolutely experienced health inequalities. So alongside other organisations, we are trying to dismantle some of the systematic racism that we know exists in, in our society. And we are trying to work with the community to address some of that. Um, and definitely try to um, uh, reinforce that they can trust um, our organisation and the people around this room to try and address some of those issues. Um, and I definitely want to give time for my um, colleague here, Anil. Yeah, Anil. Um, and I don't know, Deborah, if you just want to have the last word before I hand over to Anil. But thank you very much for your time this evening, everybody. Um. <clears throat> Firstly, just to reiterate, thank you very much to Gina. It's, it's been a great year and her support has been completely unwavering. And that is a, a huge heartfelt thank you to Gina uh, from everyone in mind in Haringey for that support. I'd, I'll, I'll reiterate what Lynette said. I know many of you in the room and we've met, in, uh, I, I suppose, in different occasions. But what I would like to say, each and every one of us in this room has mental health. Each and every one of us in this room are going to take a unique journey when we think about our mental health. And mental health is all of our business. Yeah, it's everyone's business. And we all have a responsibility to ourselves, to our friends, to our family and our communities to ensure that we give hope to people when we think about mental health. Because if we don't have hope, there's not anywhere to go. Yeah, and I look to each and every one of you personally, professionally, in your roles as counsellors, whatever you do as your day job, absolutely give that hope to everyone because it's all of our responsibility to do that. But thank you very much and very, very uh, honoured to be asked to come here this evening. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Anil. Um, I was part of the volunteering uh, for the earthquake appeal in Turkey. Um, the reason I'm here is basically I want to highlight the, the mental health um, situation for the young people who came to, to, to volunteer, uh, most of whom which we uh, criticised for not helping out in the community or losing uh, their, their culture and uh, where their parents came from. But at the time of need, uh, they all came out in, in their hundreds and even thousands um, over like 10, 10 sites across North London alone. Um, and I'm not aware of like the rest of London, how much help was going on. Um, on, on the site that we were, we were at, um, anyone who you would talk to had lost a family member, um, immediate or a neighbour, or they knew someone who, who'd passed away. 
unfortunately, because of the severity of, of the earthquake, we, we never got a chance to actually mourn. So it took two, three weeks before we actually hit in. Um, and then basically that, that's when it started kicking in. You understand, OK, I've lost this many family members. Um, and, and until basically we started talking, to each other, you, you understand that uh, everyone's having, having the same issue where they're suppressing their, their feelings. So, and that's another issue within the Turkish and Kurdish community as well, especially with the young men. Um, it's it's an ego thing where as soon as you talk about your emotions, you basically laugh at or uh, look down upon, if you like. Um, and this is something that's culturally come down from our parents as well. Um, and this, this is. The taboo, even our parents don't talk about mental health because as soon as you mention mental health, you're just seen as crazy um, and before it's even diagnosed with something specific. Um, and tying it back, as, as I said, to the earthquake um, with the volunteering that we're doing, I can I still see people who seven weeks on, today would be seven weeks to the day where the earthquake happened. There's still young people uh, at some of the centres trying to volunteer. And for me, I don't know, is it, is it them trying to basically look away from the actual problems and constantly help so they don't actually have to face reality. But um, my basically call to the council would be if you could go to like some of these local community centres, uh, you've got Diamed, you've got Gig Dead, you've got the Gemma, you've got the Ali Federation, you've got the Kurdish and Green Lanes um, and speak to the community leaders there and just, just get their advice and opinions as well, because a lot of young people have stopped attending these community centres and are now pretty much on the streets doing things that we don't want them to into gangs or basically things that are not uh, beneficial to society as a whole. Um, you guys have the power to, to, to help out the community. Obviously, Harringate has one of the highest Turkish and Kurdish communities in, in London. I'm from Hackney myself, um, but Hackney hasn't been this supportive um, as, as you guys have. So um, I'd just like to say thank you and hopefully you guys can reach out to the Kurdish and Turkish community and offer your support further. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, very nice speech, I have to say, and I agree with a lot you said. A lot of communities from ethnic backgrounds feel, I identify with that because the civil community is the same. It's hidden away mental health problems. So, Everything you said is correct. Thank you. Now, um, I have a few councillors that want to take part in this debate. I call first on Councillor Colly Harrison, the leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for uh, bringing this uh, important debate tonight. And thank you for the speakers and all the words um, very eloquently put and very powerful. Mental ill health will affect one in four in the UK, but sadly, it's often on the first area which loses out when budgets are tight and too many people are unable to access the help and treatment they so desperately need. Lib Dems have continued to push for physical and mental health to be treated equally in the NHS because not enough resources reach frontline mental health services and there's still a long long way to go to achieve real equality for mental health. Without proper funding and national prioritisation for mental health including strengthening the draft mental health bill which is currently going through parliament, local authorities, charities, communities will not have the adequate support and resources to make the transformative changes that are needed. This is even more crucial now as we continue to face a cost of living crisis and the long term impacts of COVID and lockdowns, which combined have resulted in untold impacts on mental health. We need a government that will expand mental health support services to get people the appropriate care they need in the community and reduce existing strain on ambulances and A&E departments. A government that will commit to no one in crisis being turned away and ensuring deep integration between mental health trusts, local authorities and hospitals. That will ensure our frontline service professionals within schools, universities, community support settings, councils all receive better training in mental health and add a requirement for mental health first aid in the health and safety first aid regulations, as well as much, much more. But we can't simply wait for national change. Local authorities can already better understand the mental health needs within their communities. And one way to do so is by reflecting inwards. Many large organisations already prioritise mental health internally with their staff and clients or service users. This puts considering mental health at the forefront of all actions and has proven to have a dramatically positive impact on mental health. 
So whether it's setting up a dedicated mental health vulnerable helpline operated by specialist staff for residents, or weekly internal wellbeing check-in sessions for staff with dedicated trained professionals, or a culture of no out of hours emails, or dedicated uh, WhatsApp numbers that staff can use to speak with trained professionals completely confidentially, there's plenty to be done. Large organisations such as councils are already can already embed best practice for improving mental health within their culture without major reform. But what is key is first understanding what is affecting the mental health of those who interact with the council and looking to improve those areas with real results. By the council understanding its own mental health needs, it can better offer mental health support to our residents. Haringey can evidence that it wants to improve in this area by signing up to the Mental Health at Work commitment, joining other councils who have already committed and declaring publicly that mental health at work is a priority for the council. The six steps step out, set out the commitment can then be used as a springboard for making a sim similar commitment, not just for council staff, but for our residents and for our service users too. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to remind um, councillors, so, um, you, you got up to three minutes to speak. Uh, Councillor Barbara Blair, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The sidelining and defunding of councils serving some of the poorest parts of London has been a constant theme of national government policy since 2010. Complaints about cuts and the effect on mental health well-being have become routine and often feel futile. So this evening I'd like to talk about the importance of relationships and of deep listening to our residents. My vision is for a more human, person-centred welfare state which embraces social solidarity, belonging and gives everyone a secure safety net. Local government can start to deliver this by removing self-limiting siloed services so staff can work alongside communities in high trust environments. Now I know this sounds a bit fluffy or borderline woolly and I admit that concepts like participation and power sharing can be seen as only for the well-off or retired or are easily said but are found too time consuming. But for those who the local state is a vexing and intractable part of daily lives, too often spent waiting on the phone for ages to get repairs done, or trying to get support to tackle drug dealing or antisocial behaviour on their estates, and whose mental health and well-being affected detrimentally, there is nothing abstract about person-centred social solidarity, belonging and safety. In fact, I believe people are hungry for it, and I believe we have to believe that we can deliver this. A good example for me is the Olive Morris Court, and the journey in opening this homeless shelter ought to be documented in how not to do a consultation. However, I would like to pay tribute to Cabinet Member Donna Carling for her role in taking on board and understanding how the Olive Morris Court new development affected the mental well-being of residents who live in close proximity to it. There is a way to go yet, but I'm hopeful that what we have now at Olive Morris Court is the beginnings of a good ending, where social solidarity can bring about positive change for both sets of residents, and it needed someone to listen. That was the most important thing. Madam Mayor, we can have all the love and kindness in the world, I know that. Let's start with better government funding. But I truly believe that a partnership focused on the rights of communities would go a long way to tackling and understanding mental health wellbeing in Haringey. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to our speakers from mind as well. Uh, thank you. Castle O'Connor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so this evening, I just wanted to again reiterate my thanks to those who've come in and done the huge positive work that you do in our borough. So again, huge thank you from us. 
of all tonight. Um, so I just want to address the importance of community involvement, which I know you're, you play a huge part in, in involving mental health services in Haringey. So as we've said tonight, mental health is a critical issue that affects everyone and it's essential we work together to ensure our community receives the support that it needs. One approach that can greatly support mental health projects and initiatives is, as we've all said before, the co-design approach with the community. We all know that co-design involves working collaboratively with community members to develop and implement initiatives that meet the needs and address their concerns. This, I know, has started in Haringey and it's been working um, and positively, but we need to ensure it's embedded across all our service designs and provision. By involving the community in the design and delivery, co-design can help to ensure initiatives are tailored to the needs and preferences of the communities they serve. It can also address any barriers to accessing mental health services or support that may be specific to certain communities, such as language or cultural barriers. Furthermore, the co-design can help build trust and engagement with community members, leading to greater uptake of mental health services and initiatives. By involving individuals with lived experience and as we've heard tonight, understanding what your suggestions are and taking them on board and working with that, that could really help and address um, any concerns or misconceptions that the community may have around the services that we're trying to provide. Another significant advantage of co-design is it can foster a sense of ownership and empowerment with the in the community. So as a community, you can feel more invested in any initiatives that you help develop, leading to greater buy-in and therefore support. The council can use a range of methods to ensure that any co-designs initiatives are working. So things that may sound boring, but like data collection and analysis, but that's hugely important. Feedback from service users, monitoring and evaluation of those services and collaboration with the mental health professionals and regular reviews. So by using these methods, the council can ensure that initiatives are meeting the needs of the community and achieving the desired outcomes. The council must commit to supporting those with lived experience or from the community who help with this co-design service. Without access to ongoing professional support, those who give up their time may feel excluded and the process risks become tokenistic. We can all think of projects within our own communities, for example, providing the mental health offer within schools, where the involvement of young people is essential, especially in gaining insight into what services work and those that don't. Without those young people getting the right support during the co-design process, their suggestions could be overlooked and we'd lose their valuable insight into these services that are supposed to work for them. So thank you for listening today, but I really hope that the council urged, we urge the council to continue to support embedding co-design in this process. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mason. I said no. Thank you very much, um, Madam. Mayor, and also thank you very much for everybody who's contributed to this debate and especially to MIND and Haringey. The, I want to talk about a specific aspect of mental health and we know that mental health comes in very many different forms and very many different shapes. And one of the particular aspects that I've got personal experience and also working experience of is trauma and its impact. So I would like to for us to spend the next couple of minutes just thinking about trauma and how it affects all of us. Trauma is a frightening, dangerous or violent event that posts a threat to life or bodily integrity and which can last throughout your lifetime. It's especially important when it's impacted on children and we know that adverse childhood experiences such as domestic abuse, sexual abuse, living with alcoholic parents or um, any other event which creates trauma for the child has a higher chance of a negative impact throughout their lives. Feelings of unworth, feelings of shame, terror and fear leave mental scars and an increased risk of psychiatric symptoms throughout life. Coming from domestic abuse, sexual abuse, neglect and violence in the family and community and leading to people self-medicating, self-medicating with drugs, 
alcohol, self-medicating, um, with a range of different forms of behaviour, all of which we as a society look down on or feel that they are not, um, they're, they're not welcomed in our society. But yet again, we also know that that lack of welcoming, lack of trust and lack of understanding creates further trauma for people. So it's very important that trauma informed care and therapy, which is so important for our children and survivors, um, so that self blame is diminished and minimised. We know that children blame themselves for things that happen in childhood. The current NHS response of um, CBT, which is cognitive behavioural therapy and antidepressants can be more harmful than good than do good for victims of trauma. We need trauma therapy for our children and for adults who've experienced trauma. And we need trauma informed practice and trauma informed care throughout all our services so that we have an understanding of why some people might act or work in different ways. We need to understand that with children and also with adults and we need to make sure that we all listen and understand and make sure that there are services to respond to traumatic events which have happened through nobody's no victim or survivor's fault thank you thank you councillor ian Curran, please Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Mike Haringey, for your deputation and the amazing work you do for the residents here in Haringey. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah. This is a hugely important issue, and I feel extremely honoured to be able to give my maiden speech at the full council on this matter. Many of you will know that I'm an NHS doctor, but most of you will not know that my wife works as a mental health worker. So this topic has huge resonance in my household. One of my first cases as a newly elected counselor was to support a resident. The complexity of the case, the difficulty in accessing care when needed, the poor communication between the health workers and the family, and the protracted nature of the case was truly heartbreaking. I'm sure this is something that many of you here will be familiar with. The question I ask is why? Why is it like this? And why does it continue to be like this? I'm sure many of you have your views and you have heard some of those views shared here today. Although the title of this deputation is focused on Haringey, I think this is a much wider issue, a national issue, and I would like to take a wider focus. Yesterday in The Guardian, Gordon Brown wrote that he thought budgets were more, more than a catalog of figures and headlines, rather moral documents. He's absolutely right. Budgets are moral documents that tell us what kind of society we are and what we aspire to be. For the last 13 years, we have seen the effects of austerity, worsening poverty, increasing use of food banks, and shameful neglect of the most vulnerable in our society. He goes on to say, that the government should be seeing what he and millions of people are witnessing, a poverty that is becoming so entrenched that mental illness is on the rise. This must be a wake up call for all of us that the combination of harsh austerity and our economic model that places human beings as units of production is simply not working. This model that measures success with three alphabets, GDP is no longer fit for purpose. What is needed now is a radical overhaul, and I put forward to you well-being 
well-being as a new metric for the measure of success of our, of our economy to be on par with GDP. In order to deliver this, we need a new NHS that is fit for the 21st century, that elevates mental health to be on par with physical health. I am proud to say that for the first time in a generation, like in 1946, when Attlee and Bevan had the courage to enact the Beveridge Report and create the NHS, 75 years later, we have a leader, Keir Starmer, who is proposing a radical overhaul of our, our health services that is fit for this century. One that will focus on prevention, the holistic, holistic in its outlook, and care for patients and rewards for workers as they deserve to be. More locally, this council has increased its spending on adult and child services, but much more needs to be done to support services and increase awareness. I want to end by saying this. As an NHS worker, I will do my utmost to advocate for patients, carers, and healthcare workers. I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Councillor Barclay. Thank you. As I think it's clear for, for many of us, this debate is personal for me. I've had depression for almost 20 years, and today I kind of want to talk a little bit about how we need to put the individual at the heart of what we do. It's great to hear from, from Ty and his commitment to, to do that, but last week I had a rather different experience. I was dismissed by a doctor after four minutes when trying to talk about new medication I was taking and my concerns. His questions were perfunctory, and at no point did he ask how I was feeling. Now, we know doctors are stretched, we know all services are stretched, but it's just not good enough. And I'm somebody who has a good support network and can advocate for us myself. Lots of our residents in Haringey do not have that privilege. And I think it's really important that we recognise that whatever point someone finds the courage to talk to someone about their mental health, they need to be met with compassion and understanding. And that is responsibility that I think falls not just on medical professionals, but on all of us. Now, the first time I found that courage, I, again, I went to a doctor who told me I was probably just bored because it was the summer holidays from university. And when people aren't met by that compassion and understanding, it completely sets them back because people who have mental health problems often already doubt themselves, often already think they don't deserve to be listened to and to be acknowledged. So I think it's important that we all, whenever someone confides in us, what we do is listen um, and, and give the best support that we can. I think we need to welcome more and more people having the courage to, to come forward and to talk about the mental health problems that they have. But we have to acknowledge that we just don't have the resources that we all wish that we could. You know, so many services are stretched. People are waiting months and months for counselling. I've had to call the police on friends and neighbours because there isn't out of hours services too often. And that is not fair on, on the police and it's not fair on the people who are being helped. Now, I think there is a commitment and a consensus here today that we all think more should be done. And I welcome a lot of the things that um, our cabinet member, um, Lisa Desnevis has set out to do. Particularly, I want to mention the, the plan for Canning Crescent, which I know is unfortunately beset by delays, but it's a it's a project that puts people at the heart of it. And it's a project which also talks about people as individuals with specialist care, but also an out of hour service where people can go, which is not just about getting people when things hit crisis point, but actually trying to step in beforehand. And I think all of us need to be conscious of trying to prevent things before they happen. Um, because that's the best way that we can all move forward. So I just wanted to end by saying, you know, thank you for all the contributions. Um, and I think there is an agreement that, that we need to um, all do our bit in this debate. Thank you.
thank you. And Councillor Bella. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We've heard tonight that one in four people will experience a mental health problem each year in England. And with these types of odds, it's tempting to think of mental health as a great leveller. But while in one sense this is true, if you look a bit closer, the link between poverty and mental health is unequivocal. We know that children from the poorest 20% of households are four times as likely to have serious mental health difficulties as those from the wealthiest 20%. All of us here will remember that during the COVID-19 pandemic, when Haringey experienced one of the highest unemployment rates in the country, Haringey residents had the highest drop in life satisfaction in London, 9% compared to 1% the London average. As our adult social care services observed at that time, for many Haringey residents, this led to a severe deterioration in their mental health. And as the cost of living crisis continues to bite, Mind and Haringey, who are here today, have reported an uptick in referrals for their services. Sadly, in this country, your bank balance doesn't just increase your likelihood of experiencing mental health difficulties. It also impacts whether you can access the help you need. While the most affluent can afford to go private, the rest of society has to join a mile long queue. After 13 years of Tory mismanagement of our NHS, there are 1.6 million people on the waiting list for mental health treatment in the UK. But things are getting better here in Haringey. Just last month, 12 of us councillors in this council chamber met with senior NHS and council officers to discuss the enhanced package of support that is now available for adolescents in Haringey as they make the delicate transition from children's to adult mental health services, a process that has historically been far from smooth. And I know many of us are looking forward to the next Labour government, which will deliver mental health treatments within a month for all those who need it. But when we know that the needs here in Haringey are so acute, we simply cannot afford to wait until the next general election. We can start here by designing our local services with an understanding of what living with a mental health condition is like. For someone experiencing a severe depressive episode, navigating council services can seem like a steep mountain to climb. This understanding must inform how we signpost access to both the mental health and the cost of living support that is available for our residents, a challenge that I know is at the forefront of Cabinet members' minds. Colleagues, the Tories have created a pernicious feedback loop between the largest drop of living standards since the 1950s and decimated NHS mental health services. Let's break this cycle here in Haringey. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to our speakers today. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, Councillor Inkhaven and, and Councillor Bella for their maiden speech. Well done. Uh, now I call on the Cabinet Member for Health, Social Care and Wellbeing for the Council to close the debate. Councillor Desmeris, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and thank you everyone who participated in the debate, but particularly thanks to Lynette and Deborah and Anil. And I know Anil that the leader has been out to meet the community post the earthquake, and I know that that work will continue. So thank you for coming and highlighting um, how our community is feeling. I'm proud to say that we've made mental health a priority in Haringey, and it's most certainly a priority for me. We know that severe mental health illness rates are higher in Haringey than the London average. Things were difficult before the pandemic and they haven't got any easier. But I'm pleased to say that we're serious about making change. A few weeks ago, we came together all the services that support people in the borough at all levels. From grassroots community to our mental health trust and vital partners like MIND. We have begun the work of identifying gaps and understanding what our residents need more of or even less of. We could point to many reasons why the need is so great here in Haringey. Chronic underfunding of mental health services, a shoddy benefit system, 
pressures on people due to inequality and racism. Things like this take their toll. The government, this Tory government and its facilitators have a lot to answer for. Yet we do have some really valuable services in Haringey. And I'm delighted that Mind in Haringey has brought Brack Thrive to the borough. There's Studio 306, the Clarendon Recovery College, Tottenham Talking, the Wellbeing Network, the Suicide Prevention Group, and so many others. Services that meet people where they are and work with them to develop and respond to their needs. And of course, the London wide, but Haringey created Great Mental Health Day. We don't just have to lead on the challenges. We can, we are, and we will be leading to make sure nobody feels alone and that everybody can find a place in this borough to talk about their mental health experience when they need it. That concludes the debate. I would like to thank everyone for their participation in the debate, and in particular, our guest speakers. I hope that members will continue to support Mind in Haringey as they are a key partner in our support to residents. I personally, personally speaking, I have visited um, you know, the organization a few times. I can't express enough, thank you doesn't seem to be enough somehow for all the work they do. I'm very impressed, very honored to highlight the, the work you do this year and I wish you all the very best and I will still, whatever you had I wear the next few years, I will always support you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. As item 12, as part of this item, I have received two deputations which I have accepted. We have deputation one from Living Streets asking the council to support and continue at, at pace implementing the working and cycling action plan. We have deputation two from having a cycling campaign urging the council to take a stronger action to rapidly achieve uh, vision zero, which is a zero fatal and serious road injuries. Deputation one, please come forward and make your representation to the meeting. You have five minutes in total to make your deputation. Thank you. Hello, we are here from, from Haringey Living Streets. Um, and we, we thank you very much for allowing us to come and speak here. I'm Annabelle from Healthy Streets Alexandra. I do not own a car like over half of the borough. And I do not cycle either. When I was a child, the streets and buses were filled with children of all ages. And I was eight when I started going to school on my own. But my daughter was nervous of, of crossing our road on her own, even when she started at secondary school, a short walk away. The traffic pours down a side street from Muswell Hill near our house, joining the streams from the North Circular and Hertfordshire. The accident rate for walkers on minor roads is very high, that is relative to, to, to total traffic, much higher than on main roads. But this plummets in traffic filtered areas. We have been campaigning here for over 20 years, but the traffic is now worse than it ever was. 
I am, however, impressed by the council's recent use of, tra of traffic filtering. I was walking along Philip Lane recently, a boundary road, to find the traffic, if anything, less than it was before. I urge you not to be put off by the noisy opposition. Walkers really need more traffic filtering to be rolled out across the borough. On the main roads, the buses are so unreliable, we urgently need 24 hour bus lanes. But buses getting snarled up on green lanes is not a new thing. The businesses there will be much better served by busloads of passengers than by the few parked cars that hold up the traffic. Finally, timed crossings. Many of the need faster response times, but others need to allow more time to cross the road. Really important for the elderly and frail, for wheelchair users and parents and carers with buggies and young children. Thank you. I'm also not a car owner. Um, so it's Friday um, evening, 4th of November, 2022. I went outside to empty our recycling. We live in the second floor of flats in Anne's Road near Green Lanes. The moment I get back to the kitchen, I feel the entire building shake. It feels like an earthquake. We run to the front of the flat and see a cloud of dust and smoke. An eastbound car driver in a Toyota Yaris has run off St Anne's Road, mounted the pavement, demolished our wall, uprooted our hedge and gate, landed on my recycling bins, yes, the same recycling bins, blocking the exit to our building, leaving 10 residents trapped in their homes, deeply shaken and somewhat terrified, wondering, is this car going to explode? So we'd like to thank the council and we celebrate as we celebrate with Camden, Islington, Hackney, Wharton Forest, Paris and Barcelona in taking steps to reduce car traffic on our roads. St Anne's Road is one of the boundary roads of the LTN, yet we have noticed a considerable reduction in car traffic and we see a much wider demographic walking, cycling and scooting to school. At certain times of the day, there are blissful moments with no car traffic at all. Over half a century ago, Copenhagen and Amsterdam began reallocating resources away from the cars as it was too expensive and too many children were being killed. Having lived in Denmark, I know firsthand how safe roads and well-designed cycling infrastructure feels. In the 1970s, there was a change in the mindset. Governments made important choices. We in Harringay also need to continue our journey of change. We can no longer afford and we need to move on from the dominance of the car. Today, some say there's a climate crisis. Some say there's a political crisis. We say if not now, when? We cannot wait another half century. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mohammed. I live in St Anne's. Since last summer when the LTNs were introduced, the change to my local area has been incredible. Now, when we walk to school with our small children, we can talk to them and actually hear them reply. It's a refreshing change from having to pause the conversation and wait for the traffic to pass. We've also started cycling uh, with them and we've both, they've both noticed the reduction in traffic and noise. They really enjoy using their bikes and are already learning to cycle on the road with us, something we probably wouldn't have considered before. We also now see lots of our friends cycling to school and enjoying the quieter streets. Several of them have said they would never have considered it before, but the Streets for People initiative has given them the confidence to go out and enjoy the local area. The same thought was also shared by a number of residents at our most recent walk and ride event, which had over 150 participants. There's been concern from some local residents about access to their streets and the impact on boundary roads. I think there is still a lot of work to be done, and I asked the council to start working on improving crossings and removing unnecessary parking on main roads, as well as making junctions safer. Sometimes me and my children end up waiting several minutes to cross as the lights take so long to change. I often see people give up and try to cross in between traffic. 
we need more crossings and we need them now. The council needs to keep working with the local community. There are so many areas that are in need of safer streets. We saw overwhelming support during the consultation two years ago, and there are plenty of people living in the borough who continue to support change. Keep collaborating with local businesses and continue to make the improvements required for the wards to really thrive. Our family and friends have experienced a wonderful change to the area, but it's only the first step. Our children's futures are at stake. We need you to keep working with us and make the streets safer and healthier for all of Harringay's residents. Thank you. Um, Councillor Helmut, I understand you have a question. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question is, um, one of the things that we often hear as councillors is that uh, there wasn't enough consultation around the implementation of some of the um, traffic reducing schemes in the borough. So I wonder if you could tell me a bit about how health, uh, the Healthy Living Groups, St Anne's in particular, came about and what work has been done with the community um, with that group. So um, a lot of the consultations happened during COVID, so a lot of it was remote. Some of the parts that happened earlier on uh, were in person. Um, there were events at local community centres. We set up stores in the park. Um, we joined the consultations with the council. Um, we were at a lot of different sessions discussing the changes and the options and what was available. Um, a lot of the uh, residents in St Anne's, well, uh, we have about 100 people in our Healthy Street St Anne's group, and those people really contributed quite a lot to the consultations that the council did. Um, I can only say that there was su such a long time ago, I can't remember all of them because it took another year for us to actually implement the schemes. But now that they're here, they, they really have made a change. But yeah, we were there at all of the sessions and contributed as much as we could. Um, Councillor Coley Harrison, do you have a question? Oh, it's, it's actually me, Madam Mayor, but I don't know. So we always get mixed up. Oh, no, that. <laughs> no problem. No. <laughs> um, thank you for your deputation. Um, I too hear from residents who just don't leave their homes because they're too afraid of our roads. So I completely understand where you're coming from on that. The Liberal Democrat group um, suggested several changes to the walking and cycling action plan um, that were rejected. Uh, we found the report had a long term vision, but it seemed itself to set no targets or goals. Just wondered if you would agree that the target should do with a few more short term goals just to keep itself going and not look to the future to try and find better ways to do it. I actually agree. I think that that's um, something that we had assumed would happen all along. Uh, when we originally were at the consultations, we were told we were the first of three, not the only three. Currently feel like we're the only three being picked on for that as well. Um, but I believe that the rest of the borough really needs some help and we really need to keep driving the change. If you set some targets that really sets a deadline for the homework to be done. And I think everyone needs deadlines. Am I right? Well, when we don't have a deadline, we tend to just procrastinate and take time over things. So yeah, putting in some targets, the entire borough, when's that going to be done? Is it 2027? Is it 2028? Is it 2041 when it's too late? I don't know. But yeah. Uh, thank you, Councillor, very much. Now I'll call on the Deputy Leader of the Council to respond, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for that uh, deputation, which um, underlined a couple of things. One, one, the importance of these schemes and the importance of bringing um, um, traffic management schemes for safety and for climate and for other aspects such as um, you know addressing social uh, the sociability of our streets and the confidence of parents to allow their children's uh, children out um, over the years there's been a diminishing uh, zone of parent of confidence if you like where children were slowly from being able to go out up to the park have now slowly and slowly and slowly been that that um, that zone of confidence has diminished to the point where they're not allowed out their front door. So obviously 
creating these spaces is um, one way of addressing that and we're seeing that happen and it's great to hear that anecdotal evidence. It's also great to hear the anecdotal evidence about the reductions of traffic that you're seeing on some of the boundary roads as well and um, that only goes to show that when you think about some of the, the, the scheme areas such as St Anne's which had somewhere between 14 and 16,000 cars going through those filtered roads every day, um, you're now seeing um, uh, uh, reduced traffic on those boundary roads, showing that there's not only reducing traffic within the schemes, but reducing it on the outside. And we certainly haven't seen the kind of increases that would have related to a like for like um, displacement of traffic. So that's all really good to hear. And, you know, in terms of the, the ask, the things that, you know, beyond just low traffic neighbourhoods, the priority bus lanes we're working on, crossings, safe crossings we're working on, and implementing and putting in um, the removing parking and pavement parking are, bo are both elements that we're working on and the programs are in motion as we speak, including safer junctions and working on those. Um, in terms of the um, time frames in our walking and cycling action frame, um, plan, we do have budgets and there are indicative time frames, but we also got to remember that we're working under the constraints of a conservative government who um, fund the, and the funding model that they use is one based on competition between boroughs with small pots of money. Um, they don't come to us and ask us how much will it cost to implement this? Then we'll give you so much over the years. They say, here's a pot of money, now fight over it. And um, and that pot of money is never enough even when you win. So. The reality is we do have to prioritise and we do have to look at where, where, what we're doing and when. I can absolutely assure you that the, I mean, well, number one, first of all, that we will con continue our active travel um, programme and expand it. In the first instance, it's actually important that we look at the evidence of the first three going in. I think it would be um, wrong-headed and wrong-footed to, to um, forge ahead with new schemes when we have yet to see the actual data that's being crunched now and analysed. I think that's that's going to be important. That's happening as we speak. But also it's important that we put in, we, we also have a priority for safe, um, protected cycle lanes. We need a network of these crisscrossing the borough and that's something that the feasibility studies are underway as we speak as well. So there are a number of interventions and as well of course that our school streets programme, we are the fastest growing school streets programme in London. Um, we've got 15 school streets um, that will be going in uh, in um, in the, the spring, so very soon, and we will continue to grow that. But I'll just finish to say I absolutely agree with your your aims, your ambitions um, in terms of how we need to make our borough safer and greener for all. And um, I can absolutely assure you that the resolve is here in this in this um, council and in this Labour group to push forward for a safe green borough. Thank you. Thank you for your representation. Please can you return to your seats and you can continue to observe uh, the meeting or you're free to leave if that's what if you wish to do that. Um, now I call on the deputation, the second deputation to come and make representations. When you're ready, please. And you have two to five minutes. Thank you. We're here this evening to talk about Vision Zero, which is a campaign to eliminate road casualties, not at some distant point in the future, but as soon as possible. Helsinki and Stockholm have already showed that it's possible to eliminate road casualties within a decade by designing safer streets. The Mayor of London has committed to achieving that here in this city by 2041. 
I'm Angela. I've been cycling in London for 30 years. And I'm a member of Haringey Cycling Campaign, which has over 500 residents in Camden, all of whom would like to see safe and enjoyable cycling as a way to get around this borough. When I was working, I commuted every day by cycle, and it took me 18 minutes to get into the office and 20 minutes to get home because it was uphill. It was reliable, it was quick, it was convenient. I could put all the heavy books and papers in my panniers. It was stress free. I moved to Haringey from Camden almost six years ago, and I very soon realized the deplorable state of protection available to cyclists in Haringey. I only have a bike and I use public transport. After COVID, I used Pedal Me as an, a brilliantly convenient, comfortable, efficient cycle cargo bike taxi service, which I would recommend because somebody else then does all the pedaling. They do all the work for you and you simply glide through and it's faster than cars because it will go down cycle lanes when you have them, i.e. it's brilliant in Camden and Islington. It ain't so wonderful around here. Um, I've tried hard to persuade friends and neighbours locally to cycle. And the response is always, it's too dangerous. I don't subscribe to that view, but I have learned from colleagues in Haringey Cyclists that there are some roads and some junctions which they avoid because they are too dangerous. I think it's really sad that cyclists should have to take a circuitous route to avoid dangerous junctions when cars can just blitz through. I hope that I'll go on cycling into my old or older age. But that'll only be possible if you in Haringey can produce the kinds of safe cycling routes that will enable all of us, young and old, to cycle safely in this borough. Cycling on a much larger scale than just the few of us who do it now will only be achieved if you can produce safe, connected cycle routes for us to persuade people to move away from their cars. And it's only by doing that that you will get active travel, cleaner air, safer streets, and equity for all. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kim Roberts, a teaching assistant in the primary school. I live in Crouch End. Primary transport is my bicycle, my wheels. Took up a challenge in 2020. Pandemic conditions left me with no other choice. Getting to Enfield from Haringey, my wish commute came to life. Quickest, cheapest direct route I've ever had. No race, just a ride, loved it. Quiet most of the way. Open air, green bits with nature, people passing by, able to read them to swerve without us coming to harm. Great mood booster, a smile any weather, freedom to connect with family and friends, shopping, appointments, errands, or just a ride. The pandemic caught up with, with me, done with never-ending COVID. I miss my commute most of all. I wanted a bike-led recovery. After all, I knew bikes are great mobility aids. My Trinidadian granddad used his for a bad leg. It was his commute and all travel too. His driver's license was a coming of age thing, but he never needed a car. Getting better took some time. I was happy to be cycling again, but my routes from home are not all inviting. 
close passes, invisible to cars not used to seeing or choosing not to see, how to read the body language in a vehicle, problem junctions, just want to get where I'm go going, body and bike intact. The invitation to cycle begins at Bond Green Road Crossing when I reach the LTN. Uh, um, it sorry continues. to interrupt you, but your time is up. Could you just wrap up uh, another second? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Just, 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 just do that last bit. This bit. OK, just finish it then. The invitation to cycle begins at Bone Screen Road Crossing when I reach the LTN. It continues past the streets for Haringey Filter all the way to the Enfield Filter. More would cycle given a safe invitation. After all, many Haringey residents don't drive. They want cheap autonomous travel. Children want the independence to travel too. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor Bevan, I understand you have a question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You've mentioned the Mayor of London's vision programme, which aims to reduce to nil by 2041 all deaths and serious injuries on TfL roads. I've got some concerns there because my observations recently concerning all these motorbikes and bikes being driven mainly by younger people delivering food and various things throughout 24 hours. Some of the driving standards that I have seen lead me to believe that that mayor's programme will become impossible. I wonder if you have any observations on this point and any suggestions that could be made to ensure that what I suspect may happen, we can prevent. Thank you. I'm not sure if there are yet any, and I don't know what the statistics are about casualties caused by delivery drivers on mopeds and bikes. I agree that it's a risk. Um, I'm sure that among your colleagues here, there will be those who can suggest ways in which those dangers can be minimised. But I think the biggest danger on our roads is from motor vehicles currently. Councillor Colin Harrison. Thanks. Yeah, I used to sit on the London Road Safety Council uh, with Councillor White, actually, so um, probably he's the same, but I'm a fully signed up uh, member of the Vision Zero pledge and plan. Um, and uh, also as a cyclist, I agree it's the fastest way to get around Harringay. It's far from the safest way to get around Harringay. In fact, it's absolutely horrendous sometimes. But I just wondered if you could perhaps um, Kind of convey to those that don't cycle just what a different segregation for cycling makes to um, safe cycling, whether that's segregated lanes or indeed uh, low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, I can take this question. I didn't actually get a chance to speak. I have a very quick um, one minute um, speech to run through and I think it will answer your question very well. So if I am able to, do you mind if I um, if I take a minute and a half to uh, speak to, to, to your question? Um, Could you just respond to the question? If it's part of your speech, it was fine. It is part of my speech. But uh, make it quick. I will do. So um, in July 2022, um, me and a group of about 15 mums booked to go and see um, a theatre production in Piccadilly. As I did regularly, my son and I jumped on our bikes and got ready, and almost 40 minutes later, we arrived in Piccadilly. When we arrived, all the other mums commented on how brave I was and how extraordinary my son was. At first, I felt a sense of pride at their comments. However, as I sat in the production and watched the cat and the witch fly around the stage, my pride turned to sadness and this is why. Firstly, they said they would love to use a bike as their mode of transport, but they couldn't because they didn't want to die. And secondly, I felt sad because cycling your child to school, 
to a theatre production to the dentist should not be seen as an act of bravery. And my son is not extraordinary. He's a normal five year old. And if we build an environment which includes segregated cycle lanes, we will enable all children to cycle and we'll be able to reduce car traffic and air pollution. Thank you. I'll call on Councillor Sean Guani to respond on behalf of the Council. Thank you. Susan, thank you. Um, thank you for your deputation and thank you for your amazing event a uh, couple of weeks ago at the Hornsey Library. It was really great. I, I feel I have to start with an apology, really. It's absolutely freezing in here. It's actually warmer in the ice rink next door. And I am so sorry that you've had to sit here for two hours in these conditions. Um, it's all right for councillors, but it is not OK for members of the public. Um, so um, I'm a bit conscious that people are watching this at home and they would have no real understanding of what Vision Zero is. And just to kind of put that into context, it's a road safety model that's been used all over um, Europe um, and recently was agreed by the World Health Organization to be the best way to eliminate road deaths. Um, and the mayor of London adopted it um, and he wants a Vision Zero target of making sure that we don't have road deaths or any serious accidents on our road by 2041. As some of you who were at the event last week would know, um, this is actually a really personal uh, thing for me. In 2002, I was hit by a bus in Walthamstow, and I know that I'm lucky to be here. Um, the bus was OK too, by the way, but um, you know, it, it was a quite a tragic um, kind of event, and a lot of people got seriously injured. Um, I was just minding my business on the pavement. Um, this is why I know, because I returned back there um, a few years later and they moved the bus stop because it wasn't the right place to be on a bend. And this is why I'm so determined that we do things in our borough because them little changes of where we look at how we make sure that our infrastructure and the way that our borough works can actually make a difference between life and death. The safe systems approach, even though it's been accepted by the Mayor of London, the International Transport Forum, the e European Commission, and more recently, the World Health Organization. Um, while it's been accepted by all those people, unfortunately, not all local authorities have adopted this system, but we did in this chamber last year. The safe systems approach has got five elements to it. It's about safe, uh, it's about safe behaviors, safe speed, safe streets, safe vehicles, and post-collision response. Last year, this council committed to eight million pounds in road danger reduction, and some of the highlights for that work includes working with TfL to reduce the speed on the Roundway and Seven Sisters Road. It introduces it's introduced seven new zebra crossings and upgraded several more. HGV enforcement in Harringay Ward and Alexandra Ward, and we're now pushing on forward with three more HGV exclusion zones across the borough in the next two years. Late night parking enforcement is now in place until 1 a.m. to make sure we remove dangerous vehicles off our pavements and back um, on the road and stop putting the people who are trying to walk on those pavements into the roads. We were one of the first local authorities to implement a red route in Tottenham in Northumberland Park, and we have undertaken an assessment on the 30 worst junctions and corridors in Harringay with a robust plan of delivering interventions. Of course, there's a lot more to do. And the big issue here in a diverse community like Haringey is how we work on the behavioural change. We're working with our mosques and our synagogues. We're working with our local moped delivery drivers and their respective trade union. And I just want to say one thing about that. Those moped delivery drivers are predominantly working class and predominantly BAME, and they are working in conditions that are awful. And the best thing that we can do is make them safer in the job that they are doing. We're working with young people who are still texting while they're crossing the road. We're working with our own staff and contractors to ensure we raise their standards and training. But I will end with this, Madam Mayor. It will be amiss of me not to raise the fact that the government's recent intervention in the Wandsworth trial to cut speed and to stop that trial continuing was disgusting. Because what we should have seen is we should allow that pilot to happen and then we could have been um, we could be, as all London boroughs and all boroughs across the country, should be enforcing speed. And it's absolutely fantastic that we've reduced the speed on this road and that road, but nobody is enforcing it except the police. And in Haringey, they just don't have the resources. The ones where child proves 
that it's possible, the technology is there, and, and, the, and the government um, intervened to stop that happening. Um, so I want to thank um, the Living Streets campaign. I want to thank all um, the people that regularly, disabled groups, the trade unions, everyone that is constantly coming to us, wanting to have the same shared ambition of making our world safer. And thank you for enduring the freezing temperatures again tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Now we uh, we we are got at uh, agenda item thirteen. Um, we have questions as part of this item. We also have one public question. Therefore, we will begin with this, then move on to receive the responses to the written questions, and then finally consider the oral questions. I invite. Jim Edwards and Philip Stock to ask their questions. Please come forward. Hi, uh, my name is Jim Edwards. I live on Portree Close. Uh, Philly can't make it this evening, sorry. Um, and the question is really short. It's about your uh, climate action plan, which the council has already adopted. Um, we would like to know if, in light of the council's support of plant-based diets, as a way to reduce scope three emissions, it will be willing to serve to only serve plant based foods at future meetings and council catered events. Given the overwhelming evidence highlighting the impacts of animal agriculture on the environment, we believe this is the only rational step forward for Harrogate. Uh, thank you. Nice and short. <laughs> um, I call on Deputy Leader to respond, please. Thank you for your question, and um, I'll keep it short and say yes. Um, um, no, we're, we are in our, in our um, climate action plan, as you pointed out, um, uh, moving moving to a plant pay or reducing the meat um, in the diet of um, the catering of the council and um, is something that's in there. It's something that we're looking at where we're, we've studied the um, the um, plant based treaty as well. And um, I, I believe we're going to we, we will sign up to that as a council. We're also um, looking at in our education side, speaking with the schools. We will start those conversations about how we can help facilitate and work with them in terms of moving to a plant based um, plant based diet. But I absolutely agree with you that as um, as a, as a community leader, as a as the biggest employer in the borough, it's important that we take steps to reduce the massive impact that um, the food the food um, processes have on uh, emissions. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Could you give us a rough idea of the timeline you're thinking of? Um, well, we're we're setting up the climate action unit. So at the moment, the different service areas in the council are essentially siloed. So it's quite difficult. And when it comes to um, catering, each and every service area kind of runs its own. So by setting up the climate action unit, we will be able to sort of centralise and focus that. Where the, the climate action unit is being is being put into place as we speak. So I'm hoping to be able to announce its um, its actual, you know, going into action in the next couple of months, and from then on, we'll be able to put into action those. Um, the so we're talking not long after the the in the setting up of the climate action unit. Once that's functioning, then there is no reason why the the rest of it shouldn't follow within the next few months. So we're talking within this year. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much for coming tonight. You can stay if you want, or if you wish to go home for a hot cup of tea, I don't blame you. <laughs> um, OK, I have accepted the responses for written questions admitted as late business. Do you agree? Excellent, thank you. We have six oral questions from, from members. Please can councillors participate in this item, be ready when I call them for their questions per item. In, in order to get through this item in the allocated 30 minutes, please can respond this to questions. Keep in mind 
that there is a three minute allocation to answer. The main question is two minutes to answer supplementary questions. This is set out in the what well, in the Sunday notes. <laughs> OK, uh, first I'd like to ask Councillor Ova to put your question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Could the cabinet member explain how this council supports migrants, refugees and asylum seekers? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I say that in Haringey, more than a borrower of sanctuary, we're a borrower of welcome. Uh, and our welcome strategy sets out how we support and celebrate migrants and refugees arriving in the borough. We see this as a strength with rich social, cultural and political diversity that makes us so strong. But we also know that there are huge barriers and inequalities. Our welcome advisory board brings together everyone involved in supporting migrants and refugees, including strong grassroots community organisations that many of you will be aware of. And it meets regularly to oversee what we do here in the borough. We currently are funded to deliver three resettlement schemes. That's the Afghan Homes for, Re Homes for Ukraine and the Hong Kong scheme. And each of them have their own particularities um, and eligibility criteria. The schemes are unequal and um, in many of our views entrench some of the issues around the hostile environment by feeding some of those inequalities. Nevertheless, in 2021, we established welcome hubs across the borough from Tottenham to Muswell Hill to support refugees and asylum seekers and allowing us to coordinate a borough and community response with everything from housing advice, education, health care support, uh, importantly, social connections that people need when they arrive. The Housing Related Support Service commissions a dedicated immigration advice service for people affected by rough sleeping and rent free bed spaces and pathways for homeless adults um, with immigration restrictions. Projects that support refugees and asylum seekers can be big and small. And recently we had an initiative to work with GP practices to make sure that everyone who's entitled, that's everyone, um, receives primary care and that they know that they don't need ID, they don't need a permanent dress, etc. because that's an issue that we've experienced locally. While the government persists with cruel and pernicious policies that scapegoat vulnerable people, here in Hangringay we stand with refugees and asylum seekers and our welcome strategy is due for a refresh. So we'll be working with our welcome advisory board very soon to review what we're doing well and what we could do more of. So we'll watch this space on that front. Uh, thank you. Councillor Ova, do you have supplementary question? Yes, I do, Madam Mayor. OK, please ask. Thank you. With the Home Office's chaotic hotels policy creating needless and dangerous risks for the people in our borough, how are we making the case for a humane and effective system that protects basic rights? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, Haringey is joining many other London boroughs uh, uh, implementing the Migrant Champions Network's motion uh, and will be writing to the Home Office to tell them that their hotel's policy is unacceptable, ineffective and ineffective. But frankly, this Tory government needs to stop distracting from its failures and start fixing basic problems. Or better still, as I'm sure many of you will agree, it could get out of the way and let a Labour government do it. Is there a, se a second supplementary question from the opposition? Then I offer it to um, to anyone else. If not, I'll complete the first question and we'll move to the second question. Um, can I ask uh, Councillor Colin Harrison to ask his question? Thank you, Chair. And um, questions to the leader. At the recent cabinet member signings, cabinet members have approved decisions such as changes to parking charges, signing multi-million pound contracts and creating a new rough sleeping strategy behind closed doors. 
with neither opposition nor backbench administration councillors allowed to in, in to ask questions. Will you commit to ending this undemocratic practice and ensure these decisions are made in full public view with an opportunity for cabinet members to be questioned? Leader of the council. Thank you. Um, so let me just start by saying that cabinet members signing decisions are emailed to all councillors as soon as the report is published. Five clear working days before this decision, providing an opportunity for queries or questions to be raised with that cabinet member. As part of our cross organisational focus on getting the basics right and opening up the way we work as part of the Haringey deal, we do want to co-produce decisions with our residents and our communities. So we do need to stand back and look at how we reform our formal decision making processes and systems as part of this, a part of this, including the criteria and thresholds for the, for the route a decision should take and the openness and accessibility of settings that decisions are taken in. Um, thank you. Um, Councillor Harrison, do you have a supplementary question? Uh, yeah, so can you clarify? Are you planning to end the practice of cabinet member signings? Or are you saying that they are part of a democratic process? They are part of a democratic process. And as I have said in the previous response, there is an opportunity for all councillors to be involved to, you know, it's they're done in a formal way and democratic way. However, uh, going forward, we are committing and I'm committing to reviewing how those decisions are made. But I, I do dispute that they're not part of the democratic process. They're not done secretly. Um, minutes are published um, and there are the opportunities to ask questions prior as well. Uh, is there a second supplementary question from the Labour um, councillors? Uh, yes, please do. I think my microphone's working. Um, my question is, what has this administration done to improve decision making processes? Thank you. So we have introduced an April cabinet to create more space for decisions to be taken from the cabinet. But there will always be a number of decisions that need to be taken by individual cabinet member sign ins to avoid overcrowding cabinet meetings. And as I have said, um, we are looking at where decision making processes may need to change as part of our drive to fix internal processes and get the basics right. That completes the question two. Now we'll move to question three. Can I ask Councillor Hamas to put the question? Could the cabinet member update uh, the council on the efficacy of the land licensing scheme? Um, thank you for your question. In Haringey, we have three landlord licensing schemes. We have our mandatory HMO licensing scheme, which is a legal requirement for all HMOs of five or more um, res um, households or residents who are sharing the property to license the property. We have an additional landlord licensing scheme for um, HMOs, which was introduced in May 2019. And more recently, we've brought in our selective property licensing scheme for all our wards that are east of the railway line in Haringey. The importance of licensing schemes is, is that, first of all, a lot of our residents do not actually want to contact the council when they're having problems with the landlords because they are, are concerned that this will lead to them being evicted. By having a licensing scheme, it means that we go in proactively and actually um, inspect the properties when, the, when they are licensed or after they're licensed, we have to inspect them. And what we found is that this has driven up standards, um, a, a, certainly within the HMOs, and we're expecting it to do so within the selective licensing scheme, scheme as it's rolled out and goes forward. It's provided um, within the HMO licensing scheme, we've had our um, homes that have been brought up to a decent standard, our HMOs brought up to a decent standard, have gone from up to over 90%. 
So it has been really successful and we're expecting the same from selected landlord licensing. Now, the other thing that it does, which is really important, is that by having a licensing scheme in Haringey, it also provides the funding for us to go out and expect properties and um, and to um, to enforce where necessary. We must remember that in Haringey, over 40% of our residents live in the private rented sector. And so it's really important that they are living in homes that are, so, that are safe, warm and well managed. We have currently issued over 30 in the last year, over 38 civil penalty notices on landlords and agents who have failed to license their properties under the scheme. Okay. Oh, Councillor Hammers, do you have supplementary question? Could you please ask when you speak in the, sorry, could you please stand when you speak in the, oh, you're over there. Could you please stand when you, you see, I can't turn my head a lot <laughs> when you speak to the full council. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I also ask what the current uptake of the scheme is among landlords in Haringey? The um, the selective landlord licensing scheme is rolling out very successfully, and we've so far had over eight thousand four hundred applications to date for selective landlord licensing, which is in excess of what we were expecting by this time. So um, so it is it is really su successful, and landlords are licensing their properties. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is is there a second supplementary a, a question from the? Oh, please do. Thank you. Just further to that, eight thousand four hundred applications so far. What is that as a percentage of private landlords within Haringey? Well, I think we probably um, underestimate. We've got. As I said, over 40% of our residents are living in private sector accommodation. Um, in terms of the numbers living in private rented homes that aren't HMOs, I think it's about half of what we were expecting. But I do think that um, we're going to find a lot more households um, register. That there, there are people, there are, there are homes being let out across the borough that we don't even know. Um, I am talking about the households on the on that are east of the railway line. Obviously, um, when the decision was made about which homes to include in selective landlord licensing, it was considered initially that we would include Stroud Green and Hornsey Ward, which has some poor housing, but it also has some high quality um, private sector rented accommodation in um, Stroud Green and Hornsey, and so. It would have diluted the evidence base, so it was on that basis that um, the scheme proceeded with the households on the east of the railway line. Um, so the, on the west of the railway line, at the moment, it's only HMOs that are covered um, by the licensing scheme. Thank you. Uh, uh, that completes question three. Now we come to question four. Uh, can I ask Councillor Barnes to put um, put your question, please? Thank you. Um, this is to Councillor Carlin. Haringey is currently being investigated by the Housing Ombudsman due to the poor handling of mould and damp issues in its properties and to see if these failings are indicative of wider failings in the organisation. Given recent stories in the press, such as the case of Nikki Lazaru and the judgment from the Regulator for Social Housing, do you think that there are wider failings in the organisation? As you know, we brought Homes for Haringey in house on the 1st of June last year um, for two reasons. One, to bring it under more direct political control, but also to improve our housing services and to improve repairs. Now, damper mould is terrible and a toxic mould is a health hazard. And so I'm actually quite pleased that um, that the 
um, the Secretary of State and the regulator and the Ombudsman in 2021 have have put a lot of focus on improving homes that are that have damp and mould and that um, and that in actual fact the Secretary of State is talking about treating toxic mould as seriously as for example Legionnaire's disease. It is serious. We we brought homes for Haringey in partly to improve services, and we know that we have problems within the service, um, as as identified um, by the reports that we had done, our our referral to the regulator, and of course the ombudsman's um, investigation into us. But we are taking um, steps in terms of damp and mould. We're taking um, specific steps to address that. Um, Next month, uh, we will be bringing a policy to Cabinet for um, approval, which will set out a framework for exactly how we're intending to deal with damp and mould. And it will um, set out timelines and expectations, both um, for ourselves and also to explain to residents what they can expect from us. So far, we've set up a dedicated phone line and a dedicated email address to deal with damp and mould. And this is an improvement journey which we are on at the moment, subsequent to bringing homes for Haringey in-house. We know that, but we are on this journey and things are going to improve. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barnes, do you have supplementary question? Yes, I do. Um, Further, the Housing Ombudsman I can't speak, reported at the beginning of March that Haringade received four complaint handling failures in the last quarter, and that's the highest number of any social housing provider in the country. Their report stated that Haringade did not comply with any of these four orders that were issued, and I wondered if you could explain why not. One of the things that we are do doing is, uh, as part of our improvement is to improve both our complaints handling and the way that we actually um, respond to the Ombudsman. So this is part of the improvement journey that we're on. We recognise that um, this isn't being dealt with adequately um, and we apologise to the residents who've been affected. But as I stated, we are on an improvement journey. Homes for Haringey came in house last year and this is something we all need to do. We um, we have set up, as you know, a cross-party improved housing services improvement board, um, which um, your um, lead member um, sits on. And we have coming to cabinet next month our housing services improvement plan, which will also drive up services. We will be, be also be co-producing with residents um, a number of different policies and are asking them to, to get involved in helping us to do that going forward. Thank you. The second supplementary is um, from the Labour Group. Is, uh, oh, OK, yes. Thank you. Um, can I ask what proactive action is being taken by this administration to fix and prevent damp and mould? Thank you. Thank you for your question. In December, um, we reported 64 possible damp and mould category one cases to the regulator. And we analysed the following data sets to create a predictive data model of the most at risk properties. So we used stock condition surveys, which we started to do in Haringey in 2021. We also um, reported our repairs data over the previous two years. Um, we looked back at where there were leaks and made sure uh, or roof problems. We looked at all open and closed legal disrepair cases to see whether they contained damp and mold um, cases within them. And um, we used um, data on some of our properties have um, structural defects which could also incre increase the likelihood of damp and mould. We looked at properties where the EPC rating was below band C, and we also looked at other um, information to do with resident vulnerability. 
we took this worst case scenario and risk based approach to assessing damp and mold and needed to actually then visit um, properties to find out whether they actually were category one um, failures, which we've subsequently done. And where we do find cat category one failures, we have policies in place such as the amount of time we will survey, we will mold wash, um, we will reduce the damp, we will dry it out, and then we will actually look for the and treat, not look for, but treat the original um, cause of a damp and mold. What is really important is that we don't blame our residents. And I'm very pleased to see that um, both the regulator and the ombudsman are very clear that it's that it's not the residents' fault if they have damp and mold in their properties. And we should not be blaming residents and um, for things such as they used, people used to say, oh, it's lifestyle issues. These are not lifestyle issues. If people are living in cold homes where, you know, with cold walls and that create moisture in their homes or whether they have um, repairs, etc., that haven't been completed. So the whole attitude that we have to treating damp and mold has has been transformed across the housing sector, not just in Haringey. And I'm very pleased to see that too. Thank you. Um, thank you. That completes question four. We come to question five. Can we speed up a little bit because I would be running out of time? So can I ask some um, oh, Councillor Jameson to put your your question, please? Okay, this is to um, Michael Carter. Could the cabinet member outline what benefits Haringey School Streets provide to residents? Okay, thank you. Just to keep it very brief, um, they uh, reduce congestion outside schools. They um, improve active travel choices or incentivize active travel choices um, to get to and from school, and uh, they also reduce air pollution. So just as one example, Coleridge School, where the estimation based on other London schools would be that the drop in um, air pollution would be around 20 percent. We saw a 30 percent drop in air pollution outside that school outside um, during um, during drop off and pick up time. So it has a very, very positive impact on parents and children. Thanks. Uh, Councillor James, do you do you have a supplementary question? Yes. Um, is the council on track to deliver the 60 school streets we promised in our manifesto? Uh, we certainly are based on we've got 23, as I said earlier, and we're putting 15 out for cons um, 15 in in the spring. Um, 15 times four is 60. So um, we're, we're we're well on track to get there. Thank you. Uh, the service supplementary. Do you have one? Uh, no. OK, that, that completes question five. Now we'll move to question six. Can I ask Councillor Emery to put his questions? My question is to Councillor Carlin. Um, yeah. The private sector leasing scheme where properties are supplied by private landlords to house those applying as homeless is an important part of our housing stock. However, with landlords withdrawing due to how poorly managed the scheme is, property voids for months on end and most importantly, our most vulnerable tenants complaining that issues such as damp and mould are not being acted on. What is the council doing to improve the performance of this important scheme? Um, thank you. I'm a little bit surprised um, by the premise of your question because um, we have at the moment 693 leased properties and we have two different models by which we lease properties from the private sector to use as temporary accommodation. Um, one of them is that we lease properties for a period of three years and we maintain them and it's very popular with private landlords. At the last um, landlords forum, there were a lot of landlords who were interested in taking us up and renting homes to us through that scheme. And the other um, private sector accommodation that we use is um, is nightly paid accommodation where we are still paying the same rates. Well, they've recently gone up to LHA rates 
but we were still paying the same rate since 2014. So there were landlords who wanted their properties back because the, the, we were paying, uh, and this is a set rate across London, we were paying quite low rates. What we're finding across London and across the country really, but especially in London, is an acute shortage of um, properties to use as temporary accommodation and landlords are stopping um, letting properties to us, not, not to Haringey specifically, this is a problem that's um, across the whole of London, because they can, uh, because LHA rates are so low, they're far lower now than market rates. And everyone must have read the reports that show how um, prices in the private rental sector are soaring. So they can actually um, let their let homes out um, for and get a lot more money in the private rented sector. So I'm 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 slightly you know surprised at the premise because it's certainly nothing to do with our scheme not being successful. Our scheme is successful. The difficulty that we have is that is that um, landlords across London are no longer putting forward their properties to rent out. Um, to social housing um, tenants or to tenants who are homeless and also are not putting forward properties that are affordable for us to discharge duty into the private rented sector. Thank you. Um, Councillor May, do, do you have supplementary question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, to give an example of the situation I just described, uh, there's a recent case of Anna Jagru who rents her home through this scheme. The ceiling of her accommodation collapsed and wasn't repaired by the landlord. Her landlord is listed as the council's number one contact for private landlords looking to rent their properties in Haringey. If the landlords who fail to maintain and repair the accommodation they provide are employed by the council, how on earth can tenants have any confidence that this department is in their acting in their best interest? I do actually remember the case of the of the collapsed ceiling um, and um, that was repaired. Ceilings in old Victorian houses do collapse, I'm afraid. Um, my living room ceiling collapsed unexpectedly. Luckily, it didn't destroy my new sofa, but it, and it didn't hit any of us. But this unfortunately does happen at times. However, as I, as I have said, this is not an unsuccessful scheme. Um, we do rent properties in Haringey to let out to our um, homeless residents. Our difficulty is that we cannot get enough properties and that's making things very, very difficult for us. Thank you. Um, I understand the second supplementary question comes from Councillor Bevan. That working. Thank you. Can I ask the cabinet member what is the council doing to find temporary accommodation for residents who find themselves homeless? Thank you, John. Um, as I've just said, it's becoming incredibly difficult for us to source um, property in the private rented sector, especially within Haringey, where the rents are now higher than LHA rates for out and north London. Unfortunately, as a country, we have relied for far too long on the private rented sector to provide accommodation for vulnerable residents in our society. This has made it, it very difficult because the kinds of people who are living in the private sector are, are people who really ought to be living in social housing. And until we've built enough social housing, we are, we, are not going to be in a position where very vulnerable members of our society actually have secure housing to live in. As a borough, we're having to think really hard about what we do because we are not able to secure enough housing in Haringey. And this is making things very difficult for us. If, um, as Haringey is a member of the organisation Capital Letters, which provides us with accommodation to use for, as discharge into the private rented sector. But to give you an example, 
in the previous two years before this year, we got around 270 homes previous three years, around 270 homes a year. Of those homes, a number were in neighbouring boroughs, but we still secured a fair number in Haringey. In the past year, we've only actually been provided by capital letters with 77 homes, which we need about 300. So that explains just the difficulty that we're in. So what officers are doing is that they are looking everywhere that they can for housing within Haringey and within neighbouring boroughs for us to use as temporary accommodation and for discharge. And we're also looking within our stock. So for example, on High Road West, where their um, people have been decanted, but those homes are not going to be demolished for a while, some of those blocks, to use some of those properties as temporary accommodation. But it is very difficult at the moment um, across London and for all boroughs. And until we actually have enough social housing for our vulnerable residents who are in need, the situation is going to continue. Thank you. That completes the question six. And now we'll move to item 14. And this is the motions. Uh, colleagues, we've got 10 minutes left. Can I recommend that we, um, we, t we try to take the two motions, but the, uh, you know, we cut down the time. So um, two minutes to, you know, and then the second speaker, the second the one minute, and then uh, the, the same with the amendments, and then I got to the chief whip after. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the first um, motion, I will ask uh, Councillor Barnes to propose her, uh, her motion, but as I said, two minutes, please. I'll do my best. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I will be tough and I will stop people this time. <laughs> Can I have a warning? <laughs> <laughs> so as every member of this council, I'm sure can agree, most of our casework relates to housing, specifically poor quality of housing, repairs not being completed to a decent standard, repairs long, long requested but yet to be done, and the communication between tenant and social landlord being poor. Many times I've heard from members of both Labour and the Liberal Democrats that they've had to intervene on a matter that frankly should never have come to them in the first place. Matters that should have been resolved directly between Homes for Haringey or the council and the residents. I could give you examples, but I will skip those. Uh, tonight we've debated mental health, so I want you to think of the impact of poor housing on the mental health of our residents. It's another contributing factor and it's something we need to consider carefully. Time and again, flags have been raised with between 17 and 31 percent of Harringay social homes failing to meet the standard and 33 percent of residents unhappy with their homes. Our council tenants have been treated with contempt, so an apology would be a reasonable place to start. Of course, that is just a start and it's a small one. Our residents who have Harringay Council as their landlord or freehold uh, deserve better. They deserve to be able to pick up the phone or send an email and receive a response. They deserve to be given a time frame that is adhered to as to how long a repair should take once it is reported. They deserve to have a repair undertaken just once, not the same repair multiple times, and they deserve to be treated with respect. A service level agreement with automatic compensation would help focus on quality repairs in a timely manner and make the resident feel a little better if it didn't happen although money is no compensation for extra time spent living in a home of disrepair. While building new council homes is enormously important, especially after decades under both Conservative and Labour governments, when this council laid the foundations for just a handful of council homes, we must give the maintenance of those homes the same import. Uh, I did ask for a warning. Uh, so as a council, we need to work toward a day when the casework received is rarely, if ever, about an issue that should and could have been resolved between residents and whomsoever is responsible for the housing service at the time. I'm sure we all agree on that. And I urge you to take forward this motion and ensure Haringey Council's existing and future properties are homes our residents want to live in. Councillor Emery, please, so one minute. I don't want to interrupt if it's just such a short time, one minute, two minutes. I expect, uh, I expect you to. 
Give me glad now I can speak very quickly. I'm going to give <laughs> examples uh, of uh, residents and, and their stories that they've, they've gladly said that they're going to give to me. First, we have Craig Sheridan, NHS key worker. Since moving in last year, Craig has had to report eight different faults, including no hot water, no heating, a toilet that doesn't flush. With each call that he tries to go to the to the council with, it takes one to three hours to get through, and he's done that 18 times. Last year, Imogen Baker's flat was flooded, and she had to move out while replace her place through a block. While apologies have been given, there are still questions left unanswered, problems not resolved, and Miss Baker has been left exasperated by the council's communication. Then there's the case of residents in Cunningham House in Hillcrest, where raw sewage has been backed up into their homes four times. Each time the council has promised that these problems are fixed and it wouldn't happen again, and yet it still happens again and again. Finally, Raphaela Lim came to my surgery at the start of the year with a damp problem that she first reported back in 2019. I spoke to her this morning and this problem still has not been resolved. The room were, was where her child sleeps, but since this problem started, her and her partner now sleep in that room. The thing I'd like to add here is this just examples of my casework that I've received in Highgate. There are 57 councils in Harringay, all of whom receive cases like this. We must not let this keep happening to our residents. Thank you. Um, Chief Whip. Thank you, Madam Mayor. In light of the time, I move that we invoke Council Standing Order 25.1 and suspend Council Standing Order 8.1 to allow the meeting to consider both motions at item 14, but might I stress as quickly as possible. I'll second this. Excellent. Thank you. Is it agreed? Good. OK, then um, we carry on. Um, as I understand, we have an amendment which I, I received in accordance with the Council Standing Orders. Can I call Councillor Carlin, please? We all agree that our housing services need to improve. It's not a secret. We're very open about it. We have a housing um, services improvement board chaired by the chief executive, which is underlines the seriousness with which this administration and this council takes the need to improve our, our housing services. And we agree that political will is not enough to bring about the change that we need to see, which is why we've set up our housing improvement board and we'll be bringing the housing improvement plan um, to cabinet next month. There's a lot to do to improve our housing services including our repair service, and it is a priority for us and for the executive. In terms of the specific asks, what we will be doing is co-producing co or co-designing with our residents uh, a repairs charter so that it's not us telling them what we should do, but it's going to be them working with us to actually design and shape the service, to design and shape the homes, and to design and shape what housing services in Haringey will look like. So I propose the amendment to reflect the measures we've taken and are taking since you brought home to Haringey House, and the importance that we give to housing services and to repairs. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Johnson to, to second it. One minute, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Housing services are essential. Uh, good quality housing services are essential. And I'm pleased that we have introduced the improvement board and the improvement plan. I second this amendment. Um, I know it was very short speech, but nevertheless, congratulations, your maiden speech. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, Chief Whip. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I move that the question be put and we move to the vote. This is in accordance with Council Standing Order 14K. Thank you. Uh, I will I'll second this as well. Uh, 
and I'll keep it short. Thank you. We've heard before from previous Labour administrations about how the housing service wasn't good enough and the plan to fix it. We had the council, then we've had homes for Haringey. We've now got the council again and we're told that all of these solutions will bring the service back um, that will help with the housing. But so far we haven't seen this. There's been no change, it's got worse. So the repairs charter that you want to create, setting standard and expectations for the council is very welcome. But unless the council bureaucracy is penalised for failures, we have no faith that anything will change for residents. And we really do believe an apology to residents is a small step in the right direction before we then ask for co-production and their involvement in something. Many people simply want their homes fixed. Right. Thank you. Now we will vote, but on the amendment. So those, those in favour of the amendment, please raise your hands. Okay, those against, please raise your hands. And those abstaining, please raise your hand. The amendment is carried. Now we vote on the on the motion as amended. Yeah. Okay. Those in favour, please raise your hands. Those against, please uh, raise your hand. Yeah, the motion is agreed. The motion as amended. As amended, yeah, obviously. We just yeah. voted the motion as amended is agreed. Thank you. Now we go to the second motion. Yeah. Now we move to the second motion. I ask um, Councillor. Warren to to propose the motion. Thank you. Uh, two, two minutes, please. Yeah. Um. So I would like to move a motion that will sign up Haringey Council to the Councils for Fair Tax Declaration. Just trying to be really quick. Um. Obviously, every year billions of pounds um that could have been spent on public services by taxation um are avoided by businesses. Uh, this is particularly immoral in the context of a cost of living crisis where our public services are already stretched to the limit. And people really need them. Um, as a council and as recipients of significant public funding, I think we should be fighting tax avoidance using the powers we have available to us, leading by example in our tax conduct, incentivising responsible tax conduct in our dealings with businesses and the contracts we award, and campaigning for stronger laws which will better prevent corporations from getting away with it. Um, after seeing billions wasted by the Tory government handing out bogus crony COVID contracts and seeing climate busting oil and gas giants make record profits from the energy bills crisis while millions struggle to keep their homes, the public are demanding transparency in how public funds are raised and spent and demanding that businesses pay their dues and so should we as a council. So that's what this declaration does and I would urge you to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to um, point out that this this motion came to us, I think, um, all right, <laughs> last May, and um, and it's taken a really long time to ensure that we can sign up to it in good faith and ensuring that we um, abide by all of its uh, caveats. So I'd like to thank um, the officers working in the finance team, particularly um, Barry Phelps, for all his work on this. I I move. I second the motion. Thanks. I'm frozen at the moment. <laughs> yeah. 
you're not the only one, Madam Mayor. And in light of that, I move that the question be put and we move to the vote in accordance with Council Standing Order 14K. Thank you. Is that seconded? Yeah, seconded. Is it agreed? In that case, we'll go straight to the... Just kidding. Yeah, before we go straight to the vote, we'll have a yeah, short statement. Castle also? What? Sorry, water? Who is Castle I can't, sorry, I can't see from here. Hi, what do I need to do? Yeah, let's, let's you go. Have the, yeah, you have, you have, <laughs> you have a, the right for, to close, uh, close this statement. Oh, I've said what I would like to yeah. say, thank you. Yeah, let's move it to the board then. Uh, please raise your hand if you're voting for the motion. Unanimous. Well, I think, yeah, I think um, it's unanimous. Everything body for it. Thank you so very much indeed. And um, good night. Close, uh, we'll finish the business and, and we are all very cold. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, God, I am frozen. Oh. I